Okay. Okay, today we are in John chapter 19, um, verse 16, and we're going to be looking at the crucifixion. Let's start with a word of prayer. Lord, as we uh, read about the payment that Jesus made in order to make us free, we realize that, um, that he did this uh, with a purpose, with a joy set before him. We know that, uh, that he endured the pain of the cross and the suffering for our sake. And we may never completely understand the depths of that love, but may your love for us strengthen us and feed our soul. And may this Bible study continue to bless us as we grow in our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so Jesus had been taken to Pilate, and Pilate, it says in verse 16 of chapter 19 of John, finally Pilate handed him, him over to them to be crucified. And of course, the them are the Roman soldiers. Right. And, uh, it says, so the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with him two others one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Okay, so then, as the soldiers were, you know, taking Jesus up, I mean, it doesn't give us a whole lot of information. I mean, from the point that he was taken from Pilate's, um, you know, governor, governor's palace in Jerusalem to the outside of the city, which in modern day, well, in, in the ancient city of Jerusalem, there was a wall around the city, and the wall where Jerusalem is today got extended so that it was a smaller city at the time of Jesus. Uh, it, it's actually not that far, though. You know, if you go to Jerusalem today, you'll find there's this place called the uh, Stations of the Cross where Jesus carried his cross and different things happened. So, you know, like where Jesus was carrying it and then he stumbled. And where, the, where his mother cries out. And so if you, if you see the movie The Passion of the Christ... They incorporated all the different stations of the cross, the things that happened along the way. You know, where, remember where um, there was a man who um, was visiting Jerusalem, a visitor to the city, and it says he was from Africa, North Africa, so he may have been, uh, you know, may have been a, um, a black man. And it says, and he was forced to carry the cross for him. Now, for all four Gospels mention this section, but not all four of them give all the same details. John jun jumps right into the po from the point where Jesus is leaving the <clears throat> the uh, palace of Pilate. I think it's called the Praetorium, and then the crucifixion outside the city walls at a place called the Skull. Now, you know the kinds of rocks that they have there. They kind of I think they're limestone or something, and they kind of deteriorate so that they have like pockets. So it, it had it was a, a round mound that would have had um, two areas that would have been eaten away by the, the weather so that it looked like a skull, like eye sockets. But it wasn't a large hill. When you're talking about it as Mount Calvary, it was hardly a mountain. I mean, you know, it wasn't even as big as Mount Rub Rubido here in Riverside. It, it, was, it was, you know, what happened was that after the time of Jesus, the place that had been traditionally understood to be the place where the crucifixion occurred, it was venerated. And people started to worship there and they would actually were taking pieces of the rock with them when people would pil go on pilgrimages during the Middle Ages to Jerusalem. So within the first couple of centuries, they ended up, um, the Christians saw this was a holy place and they, they built a church on top of it. So to, if you go to Jerusalem today, where Jesus would have been crucified, most likely was all, is it the place where they call it the, um, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. Because the place where Jesus' burial was and the place where he was crucified were so close together that they built a large church on top of the entire area. Mm -hmm. And so it's no longer outside the city. It's, in, it's part of the in, inner part of the, uh, I think it, it's um, the Christian area of the old city of Jerusalem. But at the time, this, um, this, uh, the walk from the one side of the city to the other, I mean, it, if you were walking quickly, you could certainly do it in 15 minutes to half an hour. But because he had been whipped and the cross was very heavy, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a question as to whether Jesus was carrying the entire cross or just the cross beam. 
most likely he was he may have been just calling carrying the crossbeam, and there would have been a hole in the middle, and they would have lifted it up and put it into the 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 stake that was sitting there already. It would have been in the ground, and they would have lifted him up and then just put this thing on the crossbeam on top of the cross, and they would have nailed him to that and lit you know. Or if he was, if he were carrying the whole cross, then you know, like in the movie The Passion of the Christ, where he's dragging it through the city, <coughs> then it's you know that's likely as well. I mean, we we don't know. It doesn't exactly say because the people at the time, you know, they understood how a person was crucified. So he's carrying part of the cross at least. And it says he's carrying his own cross. He went to the place of the skull, and so the Aramaic language is the um, that was the common language of the people, of the Jewish people at the time. So Aramaic uses the Hebrew letters, but it's a different language. It's kind of like, you know, German and English use the same alphabet, the same letters, but we have different words, obviously, using the same letters. <coughs> Aramaic, Aramaic uses Hebrew letters, but it doesn't, it's not, a he, it's not the same as the Hebrew language. So the, the Jewish people called it Golgotha, and, and he's telling, because uh, jo when John's writing this, he's writing this to people who weren't all Jewish, so people who may have been Greek wouldn't know what Golgotha meant, but he, he also wants people to, you know, who are familiar with either language to know, you know, that this is the real place. It was this place called the Skull, and they could maybe look at Jerusalem and say, well, yes, I know where that place is, and so they would recognize where it actually happened. And, you know, the, it says that he was crucified with two others, one on each side of him and Jesus in the middle. Now, why... It, you know, is that important? If Jesus were crucified by himself, would that have been any different? I mean, is, is there an aspect of this detail that's important? I mean, that Jesus was crucified with others? Well, it's actually because it, it is a fulfillment of Scripture. If Jesus would have been crucified by himself, then it wouldn't have fulfilled the Scripture because the Scriptures say that Jesus was, um, you know, that he was... Um, you know, uh, let's see. I, in some of the prophecies, it says that he was. Um, uh, I don't. I can't remember the word. He was aligned with, or he was um, put with the criminals. So here, Jesus is the innocent Messiah, and in Isaiah fifty three and some of the other passages in Isaiah t tell us that Jesus was innocent, and yet he was um, assigned a place with the criminals and the, you know, and the the people who were, uh, were, you know, the unrighteous. So if Jesus is put with them, then a lot of times people who would have seen these other criminals, they would have said, well, yeah, we heard about these guys. These guys are murderers. They were part of the insurrection against the, the Romans, and the Romans are killing them for treason. And so Jesus must be like them, right? He was assigned a place with the uh, unrighteous. So the fulfillment of Scripture takes place, and Jesus is thought to be, you know, oh, he, he deserves what he's getting. That's what the people who are seeing this as they walk by. Because, it, you know, the reason why the, the, the place he was crucified was outside the city gates is so the people, as they walk past the city, when they're going inside of the city gate, you would have to walk past this place. Everybody who walks past it would see, this is what happens to you when you disobey the Romans. See, they, crucifixion was a way of keeping the people, of the, of the Jewish people, from uh, rising up in civil war. The, the Romans were trying to keep them pacified and to force them to, um, to obey. And crucifixion was one of their ways of doing this. So Jesus is being made an example of, to everybody else. And then in verse 19, it, it reminds us that <clears throat> this was a public place and there, there is a reason why Jesus is being crucified publicly so everybody will get the, the idea that if you do what he does, you'll be in trouble. And what did Jesus do that was so bad? What, was the, what were the Jewish people, uh, the, the, um, the Jewish leaders trying to say that Jesus had done? Oh, they were probably upset over him throwing the gambling tables away. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, throwing the money changers out of the temple, that maybe was one of it. But, you know, specifically they said he had claimed to be God and he deserves death. And then when they took him to Pilate because they couldn't kill him, Pilate said, well, that's not my law, that's your law, I don't care. And then he says, but he also claimed to be the king of the Jews, and we don't, there's no king except for Caesar, and if you don't kill him for, for doing that, then you're no friend of Caesar's. So 
they blackmailed um, Pilate, they yeah, black, Pilate. Pilate in order to get him to cru crucify Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, but their reason for having him crucified was, was that the Jewish people said he had blasphemed, you know, claimed to be God, and they said he wasn't. And then Pilate says, well, I can't crucify him for that, but I can crucify him for being a, um, a traitor, uh, claiming to take the kingship. You know, if you claim to be the king of the Jews, and Caesar is the, is the king of the Jewish nation at this time, according to his, you know, his own um, claim over the nation of Israel, then he has to be crucified as a, 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 for treason. So in verse 19, it tells us, Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the sign, uh, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to, to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but this man claim to, claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. So it's funny how uh, Pilate gets the last word. Even though the Jews tried to force him to, to, um, to crucify Jesus for claiming to be the king of the Jews, he, he writes this thing on the, on the um, sign, and it's not just, a, it's not as if Pilate is saying he claimed to be the king of Jews, as if this is, um, you know, he's being punished for a mistake. He actually wrote the truth, right? The Jewish people said, well, he's not really the king of Jews. He just said he was. And Pilate said, no, I'm going to crucify him for the thing that you are angry about. So in essence, Pilate was trying to get back at the Jews by putting down something that was actually... Maybe he, his reason for doing it wasn't because Pilate actually believed he was the king of the Jews, but ultimately it was true. It's kind of like, remember the high priest, Caiaphas, when he said it's better for one man to die for the people than that the whole nation perish earlier in the, in the chapter? Well, obviously, he didn't know what he was saying, how, that it was true in more than one way. He thought, you know, let's get rid of Jesus and then the Romans won't destroy our, our nation, but Ultimately, because he was the high priest, the Holy Spirit led him to say something that was also true spiritually, because Jesus truly did need to die in order to save the nation. And here, you know, not that Pilate is um, is a prophet, but Pilate's reasons for doing this was to actually get back at the Jews, because what he wrote was the truth, and the Jews didn't like the truth. They didn't like. They didn't want to admit that Jesus was the King of the Jews. Now he wrote it in three languages, right? Because, um, first of all, the Aramaic, was it, um, Aramaic is the language of the people. Latin is the language of, the, of um, civil law. So it, in order for it to be um, a, uh, uh, a charge that would have been recognized under law, they had to have the, the, the Latin, um, the, uh, the, the Latin was the, uh, the charge that Jesus was um, being killed for. And then the Greek, of course, was the common language of the Roman Empire. So you have the, the, the language of the, the Jewish people, the language of, the, of civil law, and the language of the empire. And all three of them are saying it. Now, one of the, um, one of the things that I have uh, read about is that the, um, if you were to take the phrase, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, if you were to take that phrase in Hebrew and take the first letter of each of those words. There's only, in Hebrew, it would only be four words. Jesus, and then of Nazareth is a single word. King, and then of the Jews is the fourth word. Those only, those only are four words in Hebrew. And if you take the first letter of each four of those words, guess what, you, what, guess what it spells? Mm. Yahweh. 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 <laughs> the name of God. The name of God. Is that... I, you know, obviously that's me, you know, I, I don't know if that's something that, you know, that it was, if it's just people look hard enough, they'll find things. But I think it's pretty interesting to see that Jesus is the king of the Jews and he's Yahweh. He's both. He's God and man. And everything about what happened was pointing to this fact. And even though the people didn't want to see it and refused to believe it, it was still true. Pilate is evidence that he was forced to, to kill Jesus. He could have maybe stopped it, but he would have probably lost his job. He could have lost, could have lost his life. But he still writes the truth because he's trying to get back at the Jews for having forced his hand. 
And they get mad at him, and he says, nope, what I've written, I've written. And, and even in doing that, he is fulfilling scripture, and he's showing the truth that Jesus is truly the king of the Jews in more than just one way, not just civilly, not just you know, um, for the nation of Israel, but he is the king of, of God's people, the Jewish nation that is the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. All people will be blessed through you. So Jesus is the son of Abraham. He is the one who's dying for the sins of the people and because his death pays for everybody's sins, everybody who trusts in him for their salvation is blessed. So it fulfills God's promise to Abraham. You know, um, in verse 23 then, it says, When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one, uh, one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, They divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. And of course, that passage is from Psalm 22, verse 18. And earlier, when Jesus, well, actually, I don't think, have we gotten, okay, he just got crucified, and John doesn't give us the things that Jesus said from the cross, right? Because John's gospel is, is, a, is the last gospel written, and the other gospels had already told us what Jesus said on the cross. So John doesn't go into those details. But we know that one of the first things Jesus said was, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, no, at first he said, Father, forgive them, for no, they know not what they do. And before he died, he said, why have you forsaken me? And, uh, and those things, of course, came from Scripture, the Old Testament. And Psalm 22 actually is that verse that says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So here, Psalm 22 is also showing us how Jesus was going to be um, you know, taken advantage of. While he was dying, they're taking his clothing. Now, what is the, uh, what's the big deal? First, they, they divide his clothing up because clothing, I, it, it's really easy for us to take for granted how cheap clothing is today, right? I mean, you go to the thrift store, you can pick up, you know, an entire suit for a couple bucks, you know? No matter how nice the clothing is, you can still get clothing pretty cheap. In the ancient world, everything was handmade, everything took time, and it was expensive. So, you know, like, remember there was like um, Naaman, the guy who was, had leprosy in the Old Testament, and this is in 1 Kings chapter 4 or 5, and he goes, to, um, he goes to the king of Israel and he asks to be healed and to see the prophet Elijah, and, or maybe it was Elisha, and then he says, you know, um, and he brings with him gold and sets of clothing. He brings with him 30 sets of clothing. Clothing? Why in the world is he bringing clothing? It's because that was a very, very valuable thing. And so throughout the Bible, clothing was a valuable thing. So the soldiers are, this is the, some of the pay. They were on the um, rotation of crucifying criminals, and part of their pay was to take the clothing of the criminals that they had killed, and then they could use it or sell it. Now, you know, if, if they take some of his rags and things that have blood on them, they, you know, you're going to have to wash them, and they're not going to be that valuable. But because one of his garments was a seamless woven garment, it was worth a lot of money. You know, it would have been like a, like a poncho. Um, it would have been longer than a poncho, it, but it would have been hard to make because in order to make it without a seam, it would have to be like one giant circle, right? And so with a hole in the top for your head. And that would have been the most valuable of all. And because Jesus had this, we, we see that he wasn't a peasant, he wasn't poor, this is the kind of thing that most people wouldn't own unless they had a little bit of resources. Jesus, he always had the ability to earn money. He was a carpenter. That was a valuable trade. He had learned it from Joseph. He was able to use it throughout his life. And even during his three years of ministry, I'm sure that he probably fixed things and did things with his carpentry in order to do some stuff. But we also know that he was cared for through um, some of the uh, people who he met, like you know Lazarus and, and Mary and Martha, they took care of him in, in their own home. Uh, but maybe Jesus had this um, garment from, from before he left Nazareth. Maybe he owned it when he was a carpenter and he had earned the, enough money to, to purchase a very nice robe. 
And this is what he had with him throughout his ministry. And he would have been recognized by having this robe. And people would see it and they'd say, well, look, this, this man, you know, it dresses well. He has, he has means. He's not just a, a bum on the street, you know. Not, there's nothing wrong with being on the street. But Jesus, um, he, everything he did was to glorify God. And you don't glorify God when you don't take care of yourself. So here, God is being glorified by the fact that, you know, he does have some nice clothing. And, and even that is taken from him, right? You know, in the book of Ecclesiastes, it says, we bring nothing into the world and we take nothing with us. From dust we have come, from dust we shall return. Here Jesus is about to die and the last valuable piece of property he owns is being taken from him. And again, to fulfill the scriptures, it says in Psalm 22, verse 18, you know, that they divided garments among them. Let's look at the rest of Psalm 22. Because Psalm 22, you know, is, is kind of a picture of the crucifixion. But how is it that this psalm was written um, a thousand years before Jesus, and how could it have talked about Jesus? Do you know who wrote Psalm 22? Psalm 22 um, was written by was written by who? Well, it tells you in the very beginning of the psalm. It has a, a title. What does it say in the title? Psalm of David. Mm -hmm. Right, David. David is the author, the king of Israel. But he may have written this before he became crowned as king. He was anointed as a boy, but then Saul, who was the king of Israel, didn't want to give up the throne. And David, being um, a faithful believer, and God trusted that God would give him the throne at the right time. So he didn't try to take it from him, from Saul. But because Saul knew that David had been chosen to be the next king of Israel, wanted to kill him. And so while he was a, a young man, he David had to hide, and Saul was doing anything to try to kill David. He figured, if I can get rid of David, then my son, Jonathan, can become the next king. So he hunted uh, David down. David had to hide out in the, the, um, the caves around the Dead Sea. And while he was hiding out, well, what do you do? You send your army to find them. And some of those people who were in the army would have been the young men that may have trained with David. So... David's own friends have now been hired to kill him. And this is what he writes. He may have been in the cave while he was hiding out from Saul when he wrote this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night and am not silent. Okay, so he, this is called a lament. It's a it's a uh, complaint. Is it okay for us to complain to God? Yes, we always do, don't we? Yeah, we always do. That's true. <laughs> the fact is that God does not condemn our complaining. He condemns our faithlessness. So the people of Israel complained, and God condemned them for not trusting in him. But notice, okay, he complains because this is part of your emotion. If you're hurting, should we deny that we're hurting? No. We can say, tell God we're hurting. So he, he complains to God, but then verse 3 is the important verse because if he didn't say this, then this would just be a complaint and it wouldn't, he, God would not want him to, to, to finish with a complaint. But he says, Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In you our fathers put their trust. They trusted and, de and you delivered them. They cried out and, you, and were saved. In you they, they trusted and were not disappointed. Okay, so then those next two verses tell us that David recognizes that God is, even though it looks like God is gone, and, you know, he's not helping me, I'm in the caves, I'm about to be killed, and yet, when things look bad for Israel, God took care of them. He, they um, trusted in God, and he took them out of Egypt. So he's looking back to the, that would have been uh, 1450 B.C., and this, he lives in around 1000 B.C., so this would have been like 450 years earlier. He's remembering how God was faithful in the Exodus. And now he believes that God is going to do the same for him because he says they cried out and, 
you took care of them, I know that if I cry out, then you'll take care of me. So it's, it's, an, it's a word of faith, which is you know, important because otherwise it would just be a complaint. And then in verse 6, what do we find here? But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who seek me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Okay, so David recognizes that the people who see him are probably thinking, well, if God really chose him to be the king, why is the, the king Saul trying to kill him? So obviously, they, they were saying, obviously David, you know, David is, must be cursed by God because if God was really blessing him, then this stuff wouldn't happen. So it's almost like this idea that when bad things happen to you, it must be your fault, right? You must have done something evil. That's what David is experiencing, and this is what Jesus was experiencing. Jesus was mocked, remember? He, on the way to the cross, they hurled insults at Jesus. They shook their heads. They, even the thief on the cross said to Jesus, he trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. The very words of David are fulfilled when the thieves on the cross said to him, if you're really the son of God, come down and save us too. You know, it's interesting how, how closely this is because, again, David is the one that God made the promise to in 2 Samuel 7. Remember, God said this to David, I will um, bless you and your son will always rule on the throne for, of David forever. So he was talking about a descendant of David's would rule forever in the line of David to be the king forever. So who is that going to be? Well, it's going to be Jesus. But as David experienced all kinds of terrible things in his life, so, he, so Jesus would be the son of David. He would experience the same types of things as well. Uh, so it's not true that when bad things happen to us, we're being cursed. Right? David had bad things happen to him, and it wasn't a curse. It was God working through to save him. Jesus is doing the same thing. God is not cursing. I mean, in a way, Jesus is allowing God's curse for sin to fall upon him, but it's a willing thing. It's not an accident. And, uh, and so David and Jesus experience the same things here. And the rest of this psalm goes into some more of those details. We haven't even gotten to the one I told you about. Um, what verse was that again? That was um, Psalm 22, verse 18. So I haven't gotten there, but if you keep looking, it talks about, you know, the, the fact that he says, I am a worm in verse 6, uh, what happens is David is confessing his inability. And that's humility, isn't it? And so, was Jesus humble? Yeah. Jesus never had to confess that he was, that he was um, a sinner, but this actually just says, I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men. And that's what happened to Jesus. He was scorned by men. He was worthless in their eyes. Verse 9, it says, You brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even in my mother's breast. From birth I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. And so that's all true for Jesus as well. I mean, obviously, Jesus was raised by Mary and Joseph, who were very faithful believers, and they taught Jesus. But as, as young as 13, we know that Jesus recognized who his real father was, God, the fa his father in heaven. So I remember he, as a boy in the temple, he was teaching the, the, the Pharisees, and it says, and they were amazed at his wisdom. And, so, and he said to Mary and Joseph, they left, and they came back, and they said, why did you do this to us? And Jesus said, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? And they didn't understand what he was talking about. So even as a young boy, Jesus knew who his real father was. And so here it talks about how, you know, from birth, I was, um, I, you have been my God. So Jesus was like David. David always had this connection with, his, with God, his Father in heaven. And Jesus had that connection too, but it was more than just, I recognize God's my, God is my heavenly Father, but he was literally the Father. God the Father was, is the Father of Jesus as the Trinity. Jesus is God in the flesh. So this is true and fulfilled in that way as well. Um, if, we, if we skip over to um, verse 18, the passage I was talking about, well, no, look at verse 17. It says, I can count on my bones. People stare and gloat over me. So when Jesus is hanging on the cross, you know, they, they could see his bones, right? That means because he's being stretched out. And, he, you know, he, he may have been wearing like a loincloth or something, but his bones would have been, maybe were exposed from the whipping. 
but also because he was, he was you know, emasculated, he was, you know, um, stretched out on that cross. They could see him on the cross and was looking really bad. In verse 18, it says, They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. And so that happened as well. Each line of this psalm is an explanation and a prediction of Jesus' crucifixion. In verse 19, But you, O Lord, be not far off. O my strength, come quickly to help me. So it doesn't say, you know, that God will help me. It's just, it's a prayer. In verse 19, come quickly to help me. So when Jesus was on the cross, did he believe that God was not far away? Yeah. But then why did he say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he let him go through the procedure. Right. God allowed him to experience hell for us. And hell is where God re, um, God's presence is taken away from us. See, hell is the only place anywhere where God's presence is not felt. God does not allow the people in hell to experience the love of his presence. So if that presence of God's love is taken away, then you're, you're, you experience torment and dissatisfaction. And, you know, in your life, you know, life in hell is going to be a a constant irritation, more than an irritation, a constant pain. So, and so Jesus on the cross is starting, to, he, you know, he's feeling the, the abandonment of being crucified, but also the abandonment of the spiritual withdrawal of God's spirit. But he doesn't give up faith even in the midst of that. That's the important thing. Jesus, like David, never gave up faith. Jesus says, you know, the same thing. You know, he, he recognizes that his father is there and he asks, come quickly to help me. Deliver me from my life from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. You know, who are the, the lions? Well, the devil is considered a lion who, who like in First uh, Peter, prowls around looking for someone to devour. So, you know, the devil was there at the crucifixion laughing and Jesus is asking for God's deliverance. And God the Father did promise a deliverance. And that, you know, and so the Old Testament actually prepared for this. Like Genesis 3, 15. It says that, um, that the seed of the woman shall crush the seed of the serpent. You know, he will bruise your heel, but you will crush his head. So this is talking about the Messiah. When the, when the devil tried to destroy Jesus, it only bruised his heel. His death on the cross was not his end. It was only... It looked like a wound, but it wasn't a, uh, wasn't a fatal wound. Jesus came back from the dead. So even in that promise, early in the Bible, it tells us that there was hope that Jesus the Messiah would come and he would be victorious and destroy the devil. You know, Jonah, right? When Jonah was swallowed by the whale, he was there for three, or the fish, for three days, and he came out, and it was like he was a, uh, like a resurrection. If you were in the fish for three days underwater, you're as good as dead. Came back out, and he was alive. And so Jesus even said that the sign of Jonah is the pro pro prophecy of the resurrection. You know, he said that uh, just as Jonah was in the, in the belly of the fish for three days, so the Son of Man must be in the belly of the earth for three days and he will rise again. So Jesus knew that he was going to rise. He knew that God's promise to him, those promises from the Old Testament, were going to come true on the third day when he was raised from the dead. You know, you can look at the rest of Psalm 22 and see how, you know, it, how closely it matches what was happening at the crucifixion. Uh, but John doesn't go into a lot of the details about what happened. He moves quickly from Jesus' arrest, his beating, and then he goes straight to the, the crucifixion. He only mentions a couple of the, the fulfillments. So, you know, he does quote some, from Psalm 22, and then in verse 25 we'll see another thing. Um, back in John 19, verse 25. It says, Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Okay, again, you know, it shows us how amazing is, is it that Jesus at his death is still not thinking about himself. I mean, how many of us would be thinking about anything other than the pain and the injustice of it all, right? I mean, nobody could, I, no human being could do this. 
Jesus is taking care of his mother even when he's dying. You know, he's the oldest son. It was his job in that culture to take care of his mother. And for him not to take care of her because he was going to die before she died was unthinkable. I mean, how can you help her when you're dying? And yet he finds a way. The disciple whom Jesus loved was whom? Yeah. That's right. John's writing this. And, he's, and he remembers, yes, Jesus gave her care to me. He trusted me that much to take care of his own, his own mother. I mean, Jesus, of course, was raised from the dead. But after his resurrection, his, his um, mission was no longer to walk among the disciples but because he had trained them so that they could go out and to do his will. So he was going to ascend into heaven. And that was, that was really, it's kind of like, you know, when your kids grow up, there comes a point where they need to go off on their own. It's not that, you know, you don't want them to live with you or take care of them. It's just that you, they're not going to grow anymore if they don't le learn to live on their own. The disciples needed to learn to live without Jesus because Jesus, you know, not that Jesus wasn't going to be there. It's just that he wasn't going to be visible. And so they would have to depend through faith on him in order to do the work that he had prepared them to do. So John, of course, is, takes Mary into his home, and then tradition teaches us that John lived in Ephesus, and Mary Magdalene must have lived with him and may have, may have died in that city eventually. You know, she died of old age. And, and so um, John did take care of her. We know he was there for her for the rest of her life, and he was the uh, only disciple who had lived, lived that long. Because when this was written in around 90 A.D., Mary, Mary must have already died by then. Because, let's see, if she was a teenager when, she, when Jesus was born, which was most likely around 3 or 4 B.C., let's say she's 13, Jesus, when he died, and he was around 30, 33, then she would have been 46, okay? So then by the time John writes this, which is in 90 A.D., that's 60 maybe 54 years later, and she, he was already 46 when Jesus was crucified, then um, she would have been, you know, over 100 years old by the time this was written. So that she w must have died before this was written, okay? Um, most people lived in their, into their 60s. If you lived to be 60, that was pretty old in the ancient world. I'm not what happened to Joseph. Oh, Joseph must have died before Jesus started his ministry. See, because Joseph was already older than Mary, so, when, so Mary must have been around 13 when she was married to him, and he could have been in his mid to late 20s. So he was already maybe 15, maybe 18 years older than she was. So by the time Jesus left for his ministry, she, he would have been close to 50, and a lot of people died before they reached 50. 50 you know, most people in the ancient world lived in their late 40s or 50s. If you lived to be 60, you'd be pretty old. So let's say Mary was about 46 when Jesus was crucified. And then when um, she may have lived another, um, you know, 15 years at the most, perhaps. So then she probably died around uh, 45, uh, 42 to 45 A.D. And that's around the time when the Gospel of Mark was written. Okay, so Mark wrote his gospel around the time when Mary may have died. John must have taken her into his home in Ephesus. She died there. He lived there until he was arrested, and he was probably arrested and put onto the island of Patmos around the, um, around the 80s or 90s. When That's when he wrote the book of Revelation. So he may have written the gospel of John just before that, and then he wrote the book of Revelation at the end of his life because he was the only living disciple left. All the other ones had been crucified. And then John was, um, well, this tradition says that John was put into, that the, um, I think it was Domitian, or maybe, it wasn't Nero, but it was, the, it was the guy, it was the emperor after Nero who tried to kill um, John. And he put him in a pot of boiling oil, and he didn't, he didn't die. So if you can't kill him, the miracle of of God's preserving him because he had a purpose for him, right? He had to live to, to, to take care of Mary. He had to live longer to, to write the Gospel of John. He, had, he wrote the Revelation. So he, he wasn't able to, they couldn't kill him. So he, they put him on uh, in a prison on an island. So he wouldn't influence anybody. He couldn't do anything. But by, while he was living on the island of Patmos in the Mediterranean, he ended up, um, the, the emperor who had put him in prison died. And so he was released eventually. 
because the next guy came along and said, well, I don't, who, who cares about this guy? He's, not any, he's an old man. He can't hurt anybody. So they released him. So he went back to Ephesus, and he probably died of old age, but he, um, he had a chance to spread the gospel and to share the, this, go, this gospel and the, and the revelation with people before he died. Um, you know, so what Jesus was doing on the cross was taking care of his own mother, just like the oldest son was supposed to do. And it showed that he was always thinking of other people. And uh, that selflessness is, is, you know, part of his agape love, his unconditional divine love, the kind of love that only God can do perfectly, but, but we're always called to, to mirror that. You know, we will always be imperfect but in doing it, but we can still strive to do it. Uh, Paul once said, you know, that um, we see uh, currently when we look at the world, it's like looking at a mirror that is dim. See, because the mirrors in the, in the ancient world, they didn't, you know, today what they do is they take um, electro, they, they put electric current uh, and they, they diffuse, um, I think it's aluminum or, some, or maybe silver, and it, they can actually put like a, a very thin mist of silver on the back of a piece of glass. And so our mirrors today are almost, they, they reflect 99% of the light. In the ancient world, what they would do is they'd just take a piece of bronze and they just polish it and polish it. It was just a piece of metal. And you, when you looked into it, you could never see a perfect image. You could only see, I think it would reflect maybe 60% maybe of the light. So that the mirrors back then were not super good. So he, you know, the, Paul said that our life in this world is like looking at, at, at a mirror dimly. But in heaven, we'll get to see Jesus face to face. So we don't always get to see Jesus perfectly in this life. And so as those types of mirrors reflecting the, the love of Jesus to the world, we're not going to be able to do it perfectly. People will not know Jesus' perfect love from any one of us because we're going to be that dim mirror that's going to reflect part of the love of Jesus back to people but not the full light of Jesus. But it's, that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. You know, maybe, you know, just like mirrors got better, maybe Christians will continue to get better, but we won't be perfect till we're in heaven. Um, okay, well, we can uh, just do uh, one more paragraph in verse 28. It says, later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scriptures would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so that they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant, and lifted it up to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. I'm actually going to be preaching on those two passages in the next two weeks. Um, and uh, today I'm preaching on... Uh, on let's see on the uh, forsaken why have you forsaken me so that that verse or the one that Jesus says why have you forsaken me is not listed in, in John's gospel it's listed in one of the other gospels um, but notice that no, it says in verse 28 knowing that all was now completed so Jesus is he's on the cross and he knows that certain things have to take place and he you know he's he, even though he's God but he doesn't use his powers as God all the time, but he certainly is aware of what's happening. He knows that, that the scriptures were written about this long ago. Everything that was written in Psalm 22 was taking place, and he has to, he's watching it happen. He can't control the fact that these, you know, he can't make the soldiers gamble for his clothing, but the fact that they're doing it is fulfilling scripture, but there's also some things that he's doing that are fulfilling scripture, so he knows that he, you know, he asks, uh, you know, I am thirsty. You know, I don't know if, if that is um, how that fulfills the scripture necessarily, but, you know, I'll look into that for next week. Um, you know, I think that one passage could be uh, when we saw Psalm 22, verse 15. What did that say? We were looking at that earlier. Psalm 22, verse uh, 15 may, may be part of his fulfillment of that. Yeah, Psalm 22, 15 says, My strength is dried up like a pot shared. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. So, you know, t t that was a prediction of, of, the, um, of what was going to happen while he was being killed, right? Jesus, is, you know, was thirsty. 
So maybe that, that's the reference that Jesus is saying. If he didn't say he was thirsty, we wouldn't know that his mouth was like a pot shared and that his tongue was sticking to the roof of his mouth. Obviously, when you're being crucified because of the whipping and stuff, you lose so much blood that you become extremely, extremely um, dehydrated. And a lot of times people died not from the crucifixion as much as they died from other things. They died from complications. Your, your um, arteries and your um, organs would shut down because of, of the loss of blood and the dehydration. But Jesus hasn't died yet, but he, he's still going to die faster than the other two. You know, and, and then he, when he asked for the, he said he was thirsty, and what did they give him? He says a j jar of wine vinegar was there, so they put it on a sponge. You know, a hyssop plant is like a, you know, like a, a stalk, kind of, it's like a, you know, you see reeds by the rivers and stuff like that, it's like a reed, and when you dried it, it was, you know, it, you could, it was lightweight, but it was long, and you could put the, the sponge on it and hold it up so he could suck some of the stuff, but of course, wine vinegar is going to be real, if you're thirsty, that's not the thing that's going to help your thirst, is it? No. So, no. even, no. I know, so even in his, uh, even in his last dying moment, they don't actually do anything to help him. You know, Jesus is not getting anything here. No comfort at all. Um, you know, maybe they gave, they gave him something that's better than nothing, but it's still not very good. And it's in verse 30, he says, when he received the drink, he said, it is finished. So, and then at that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So his death occurs when he says it's finished, not when anyone else says it's finished. The, the, the soldiers didn't end his life. They, they, of course, the process of ending his life was what they were doing, but Jesus is the one who said, it is finished. And that word in, in, in Greek, um, um, telano, telanos, I think is, it, it means uh, it is completed. It doesn't just mean it's finished, it means it's completed. So Jesus was actually completing something. What was he completing? Dying for our sins. Yeah, it's, this is the plan of salvation. From the beginning of history, even before God created the world, it says that Jesus had, um, had planned to be a sacrifice for, for um, you know, the Bible talks about how Jesus would uh, be the sacrifice for humanity. And even before Adam and Eve had sinned, this is already planned that God would do this. So Jesus said, it's finished, it's completed, everything that needs to be done is done. So that means there's nothing left. There's nothing left to be done. Humans don't, we can't add anything to Jesus' death and his sacrifice. We can't, we, nothing else is needed. It was sufficient. That's another meaning for this phrase. It is sufficient. And so it says that he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Nobody takes it from him. He gives it up. He, he offers his life as a ransom for many. And uh, so even in his death, Jesus is in control. And it helps us to understand, you know, what was going on in the crucifixion that we can... Uh, be amazed that even even the words of Jesus are showing us what's happening here. Okay, well, um, I'll go over these um, last couple of uh, phrases next week because I'll, I'll be preaching on them. But it's uh, it's good to know as we get into the Passion uh, and the the preparation for Easter. You know, we're on the on this section during this time of the year, and uh, so I know that this will be um, good for us to continue as we get ready for Easter. So next week we'll start at verse um, 28 again.